the military intervened in Venezuela. And from this resolution, we formed a model suggesting that the U.S. capture Maduro, bring him before the ICC, and allow the world to work with Juan Guaido to assist in restoring order. The model was validated by key benefits that established the United States cannot let Maduro's politics prevent the prevention of those in danger, nor relinquish the hope of the Venezuelan people from embracing democracy. And with that being said, Madam Speaker, I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Hi there, it's Nikki Freeman coming okay. to you live from UCC Cork with our first debate and we just finished up hearing Prime Minister Matthew Griggs from the University of Central Missouri posing a fantastic plan on tonight's resolution and now we're going to turn it over to the leader of the opposition, Mark O'Gorman from UCC Cork. Let's hear what he has to say. Inaccurate to say it's not true. Russia, as Russian ambassador on this situation, has promised that they will not allow U.S. intervention in Venezuela. How does the, you know, Russia not allow things from happening? They do it by funding the Mr. Bridge. They've done this in the Middle East. They did it in Afghanistan. They did it all over the place. Uh, and so we feel, you know, it's extremely likely that if uh, the government were to go ahead, go, go ahead with this proposition, send in Seal Team Six. Um, which, you know, aside from it, we really don't understand how SEAL Team 6 um, is an international operation there, you know, U.S. based. Um, were this to happen, the U.S. is, ex or sorry, Russia is extremely likely to come out of this um, siding with Maduro, siding with the current regime, and is, uh, is very likely to offer for support to the militia group, which would remain loyal to uh, Maduro's regime, even in the absence of a man himself. Okay, that said, on to our case. What we think is most important in Venezuela at the moment is narrative, right? Because the narrative currently being, at the moment, Maduro, the ruling regime, does not have the support of the people, right? He does the support of the military, and he's done this by running the narrative that the U.S. is on the border. They're about to invade. We uh, know this as they're, you know, being, being accused and quite likely have run many false flag operations, uh, the first of which was that uh, there was a drone strike on you know, his home because he survived, and then he flagged it saying, This is US, they're coming for me, oh God, uh, if you take me from office now, the US will invade. And well, actually taking him out of office using CLT 6 would validate that narrative. Similarly, uh, the president talked about bringing in aid trucks. Uh, and the US has already done this, they sent an aid truck down to Venezuela, and it was bombed by uh, Maduro's militias, and uh, Maduro took this as being like, Look, Look at the U.S. bombing their own aid trucks. They knew the government knew this. They're going to sneak to invade us. And what, what would you know if CO6, CO6 shows up on his front door uh, next week to kidnap him? That would validate his narrative. What does this mean? Uh, just in two seconds. What does this actually mean? Right? It means that everything that the militias who support Maduro, everything that the military who currently support Maduro, because they have been told these things, they're going to believe that. And they're going to firmly align with a Venezuelan national identity against perceived foreign invaders, right? Because the U.S. is not going to be perceived as a friendly force in Venezuela. The U.S. has a long history of intervening in Central and Latin America, right? You have Nicaragua, you have El Salvador, you have all of these cases where the U.S. intervenes, they disposed or assassinated or back coups against the ruling dictator and inserted their own public government, right? Much to the harm of people. So regardless of the US's intentions, they are going to be perceived negatively by the people. Uh, people will rally, maybe not entirely, but they will rally with the militias. The army will remain in their current strength of backing Maduro and his Santos. And this is only going to cause further tension between Guido's government, which yes, might now have international backing as it currently does in the status quo, but it will face even larger opposition in the country. I'll take Peter's point since he's been standing here. Okay, which do you think matters most to the Venezuelans on the ground? Getting bread into their mouth or the vague abstract of neo heroes Well, here's the thing, right? You don't get bread into the Venezuelan people's mouths, right? If Maduro leaves and suddenly support for him shoots up because all the narratives he's been trying to spread are validated and seen as true, right? In that situation, 
the only thing, the current situation we're working with. And the divide between Bridal's um, you know, up and coming government and Maduro's regime is broad, you know, making them broader and broader. And you know, the public certainly has a reason to actually support Maduro further following the status quo position. Because what we see is most important to actually resolving the Venezuelan crisis is shifting the support of the military away from Maduro and towards Guyana. Because once the military I no longer support what Maduro's regime, Maduro has nothing to bring to the negotiation table, right? Then it's very, very easy to send in Venezuelan police and have them arrested, you know, without having foreign intervention. Then it's very easy for even just to have the military, who will now be with Guido, with you know, the democratic government, to then take down the drugs. So thank you. For, um, so yeah, so let's look at the let's take worst case situation. I've already given you, you know, the worst case where you have been in. Uh, the U.S. goes in and there's huge, you know, national uh, opposition to what's perceived as a foreign invasion. Right? But even given the best case, right, where we skip over the years of guerrilla warfare in the jungle between the U.S. or you know foreign, uh, you know, the Venezuelan army and you know with the U.S.'s help and a militia backed by a U.S. threat in the jungle, because we've all seen how well uh, the U.S. army deals with guerrilla forces in the jungle before, right? Um, yeah, I mean, that, you can laugh at that, but there are still children who are born deformed because of Asian Dory. Ha ha. But what, let's just skip over all of those terms, right? Because none of this actually benefits the people, right? None of this improves Venezuela's economy. None of this gets food in the mouth of the people. And what is even worse, right, is that because, you know, the political situation is just tiny bit more tension, right, they're less likely to get a stable government out of all of this. The guy, uh, the envoy the U.S. currently has put in charge of Venezuelan relations, Elliot Abraham, has been convicted for lying to the Congress about the Iranian conflict. He has been linked to Nicaraguan mass murders. He has uh, defended uh, the dictator who committed genocide in Guatemala. Right? Do we, so do we really believe that when he oversees elections in the U.S., he isn't going to take bribes as he has done before and has been convicted of before? Do we genuinely believe that he is not going to install an unstable public government, which does not have the Venezuelan people's interests in mind, and is more likely to uh, secure U.S. interests in oil, um, you know, which Trump managed to send him there to very much get for doing? Why is oil so important to this place, by the way, people? Well, it's the only thing Venezuela has, right? They use the economic resource which uh, their previous prime minister, I have forgotten the name, used to bolster the country, bring it up from what was essentially a country in poverty, give us education systems, give us health care systems. But now that you know that uh, oil prices stop, that is highly relevant to the situation. Right? Because the US secures oil reserves for their own interests and effectively yeah. takes control from Venezuela of their own resources, places that they leave them with nothing to support themselves and make things better for their own people. I thank you for listening to me. I beg you to please. No. speech refuting Prime Minister Malcolm Griggs' claim stating there should be military intervention by the United States in Venezuela. So now we're turning it back over to the Deputy Prime Minister, Bobby Gumbs, from the University of Central Missouri, and her job is to rebuild the Prime Minister's case and also rebut what the Leader of the Opposition just said to the adjudication panel. Okay. So first I will begin with the big picture, kind of what we've heard from the leader of opposition. I will then begin with some rebuttal, weaving in some of the points that we heard from the Prime Minister, and then we'll offer up our third point of substantive reasoning. Moving on to the big picture. Some of the things that we just heard from the leader of opposition were just big scare phrases. We saw, we heard that the military is supporting Maduro. We saw that the U.S. has a history of intervening. He brought up how, um, he brought up how there are no benefits to the economy or people, and that there will be there will be an, a lot of exploitation of oil and different resources in, in Venezuela. Well, throughout my rebuttal today, I will explain to you exactly why this is not true, and you will see the majority of this comes from the substantive reasoning from my third point that I will be providing. First, let's move on to um, the U.S. having a history of intervening. The leader of opposition brought up examples of coup, killing leaders, adding in our own leaders. What we need to realize is that we are not proposing that we add in our own leader. What we are saying is that we will be adding in Guaido, who is who most citizens acknowledge in Venezuela. They are not acknowledging this dictator that is harming them, taking away their rights, murdering them, raping their women, keeping food away from them, and giving it to his military instead. They are the ones that are benefiting, not the Venezuelan citizens. Yes, I'll take my first of two questions. 
regardless of the US's actual intentions, because of their history, Guido will be perceived by the people as a puppet government and therefore will not have the backing of the military or the people. Okay, that's really interesting that you bring that up, but actually leads me into my next point that I wanted to make. When you talk about the uh, US being and like all this puppetry, what we need to realize is that actually 90% of the Venezuelan civilians recognize Guaido, the 10% that are not in Congress or his military that recognize Maduro. The thing that is actually creating a puppet would be Russia. Maduro is Russia's a puppet. He is um, the leader of opposition brought up an unstable puppet government, but that is exactly what will be happening if America does not militarily intervene. It leaves an opportunity for Russia to come in and turn a dictator into a puppet who is <clears throat> already um, exploiting his people. Russia is already huge in funding the things that harm the Venezuelan people as a whole. They see the U.S. as allies because the U.S. has proved that they are willing to go into their country no matter what it takes and help them to provide humanitarian aid, to provide diplomatic aid, to provide economic aid. Therefore, we can see that the civilian people of Venezuela will not see the U.S. as people going in to harm them. Rather that, the countries that are threatening the U.S. that they provide the aid to the country of their puppet dictator, moving on. So, when we talk about, um, the, the leader of opposition said that there were no benefits to the economy or to the people, and he brought up exploitation, the exploitation of oil. Well, let me move on to my third substantive point of reasoning, which explains why all of this isn't exactly true. What we need to be looking at is, for our third point, that, this, that the Prime Minister's model is the best way to ensure multinational action as a whole. Look, think about it. That is something that we can all agree on, whether or not we are the opposition or the governing side, Madam Speaker. But the PM's model is the only way to secure stability for Venezuela as a whole. The Venezuelan people obviously can't hold Maduro accountable on their own, and this is why a multinational approach through the ICC is so important. The ICC exists because some countries don't have the means to punish war criminals themselves. Therefore, a multinational governing, governing body is the best way, the best approach for this. We can't let smaller neighboring Latin American countries attempt to fix Venezuela's problems on their own. This, hyster this historically leads to genocide, and typically a lot more lives are lost. Having the super and having the superpowers joining together helps keep countries in check in terms of exploitation and forces them to ask what they can do to help smaller nations, i.e. Venezuela. We can't allow a larger country to back a dictator and or propel the suffering of innocent civilians. Um, I'll get your question to this flow, please. The ICC, um, the ICC guarantees legitimacy for the model by providing a governing body that allows the superpowers to come together and supply humanitarian, diplomatic, and or economic aid while overseeing the entire process. Therefore, we can make sure that Russia, the US, and China, the big three in this Venezuelan debate, all come together and can oversee everything that is going into the country, everything that is going out, the way that the people are being taken care of, and they can have peace talks to ensure that nobody's wishes are being taken advantage of. Yes, your last of two questions, please. In 1998, Bill Clinton took the dip a uh, diplomatic approach to resolving the conflict in Northern Ireland that helped oversee the Good Friday Agreement. Can you give one example from the last century where a military approach by the US resolved any conflict in any other smaller country? Actually, I will give you examples of how the ICC, which is what I am talking about right now, has already helped alleviate tensions in countries. There are actually 44 recent examples of how they have indicted war criminals, and that is exactly what we are proposing with today's model. So, Going over everything that we have heard today, because we've heard a lot from all of the speakers, the first point that the Prime Minister made was that it diffuses tension. Um, the leader of opposition stood up and talked about Russian violence. Um, but what we need to realize is that Russia is a threat to the U.S. all the time. I actually challenged the opposition bench, bench to stand up and tell us of the time when Russia has threatened the United States and actually followed through. Um, there isn't. Do we actually believe that Russia is going to want to go through with a nuclear war that will not only hurt their own people, but the rest of the world as a whole? That's not exactly realistic. Moving on to the second point that the Prime Minister made, he was talking about dictators, and this hasn't actually been spoken about in a while, so I'd like to bring this up for you again, Madam Speaker. I would like to elaborate this on saying that if dictators are threatened by military power, they are more apt to talk and be held accountable. This is called the Libya effect. Um, um, this is the only model with the best opportunity to alleviate tension in Venezuela as well as 
Russia, the U.S., and China. No nation can be trusted to run another nation's affairs on its own, hence the U.S., which is why we are also going through the ICC. If a larger power backs a dictator, Russia, it makes the dictator stronger. This model gives power to the world court so that the big three cannot take control and exploit and hurt the Venezuelan um, citizens longer. With that being said, Madam Speaker, I would like to yield my last two seconds. All right, that was Bobby Gums finishing up her deputy prime minister speech. So far, this is turning into a very lively debate on whether or not there should be a U.S. military intervention in Venezuela. So now we're going over to Kasia Mertushka, who is the deputy or the member of opposition to rebuild her partner, Mark's case, and to rebut what Bobby just said. Thing. 
we um, as the OO say that the only model to propose and the only model going to be worth looking at and worth following is stimulus. Okay? If we say oil, so we all know oil is in the third word, and it is the most um, oil spilled country in the world, may I say? I'm sad for that actually. Um, <laughs> we as the OO propose, we take oil for the people, not for the US. We want to directly revoke um, the resource from the US because obviously under this um, region that they're following whereby, first of all, the envoy is not too, is not too credible, um, there is a lack of motive um, that actually comes towards humanitarian aid. Um, by taking the resource away directly, we're giving power to Guido um, and increasing the military loyalty which follows Guido as a person. Um, and automatically, and that will follow with a shift of the uh, position of the military onto, um, away from Maduro. Um, and ultimately, through diplomacy, this problem actually has um, the power to solve itself. Um, I don't, we don't believe that there is a massive need for the US to swoop in and act as a hero as it has in so many different situations, which again have failed. Um, I want to do my last one. I can maybe feel like I have more language than this one. Sure. Um, why are we trying to um, take oil away from the US when um, we are its key exporter, carrying over 40% of its oil? Um, Kasia Martushka, student from UCC, <coughs> finishing up the top half of the debate. Some really interesting <coughs> arguments coming off the top half, really revolving around what is the impact of intervention? Um, are we going to make things worse? Or are we going to make things better? So now what happens is we turn to the bottom half of the debate. So we're turning to closing government, who is Quiva Mimi, student here at UCC Cork. And she will be extending the government Ladies bench and down and providing her own substantive material as well. In this increasingly globalist world that we live in, we no longer live in an age where we can see people starving and suffering on the ground and can turn away and say it's not our problem. When we have been gifted by the arbitrary, chaotic nature of the universe to exist in a Western liberal democracy, to exist in a Western liberal democracy that, number one, has the resources to solve the problems across the world, and number two, has the experience we need to sit exhort things to resolve the issues, we cannot just wipe our hands clean of the blood that will be on them by association, by omission, <coughs> by allowing the majority to continue to treat the citizens of this country the way that 
around the state by giving food to the people, but what if that specific action actually creates international tension, which then leads to international conflict, which then we harm more people than we originally tried to save in the first place? International tension is unlikely to arise in that sort of situation because actually that is very much a later on in my speech. I'm going to run through most of my speech that and be like, one piece to get it through, we gave it with. So but I think it's time to briefly go through the alternatives to um, intervention because we've already explained to you why you the arbitrary nation's first law is even obligation to assist. What are the other options that are there for us except seizing or unseizing the oil? Number one, sanctions. Sanctions hurt the people on the ground the most. The economy in Venezuela at the minute, um, to, at the end of 2018, Inflation was doubling every 19 days. Putting sanctions on their trade just increases the pressure on these spaces, which, which creates more issues for them trying to live day to day. Number two, could, we could just offer an aid as possibly a solution, except the fact that Venezuela is closing its borders to Brazil and Colombia and we're trying to get aid in. Richard Branson even had a concert because somehow music solves civil war. I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> uh, number three, in, if we talk about democracy eventually coming in and them eventually having their own elections in that way. We literally have our in this situation because of a sham election that Maduro held, where he consolidated his power by illegitimate means. And also, democracy is too slow for the people on the ground who are suffering. So why is why is um, military intervention most beneficial for this sort of, uh, the most beneficial form of intervention in this way? Well, number one, it gives you a deep clean of the system. A big reason that Maduro is able to hold on to power the way he is now is that the military leaders he is working with, he gives them key parts in industries in the country, or he gives them high political positions. When we have the CLT coming in to remove Maduro, um, and we're assuming they're going to be successful because the US are quite used to doing this sort of thing. They kind of have a long history. Just look at the 20th century. Um, <laughs> so because they're, pro they're likely to be able to do this far more quickly than any sort of revolt on the ground would happen. And this clears out the system as well because when you see Maduro is being taken down, you are afraid that you are next. You are afraid the SEAL team is going to come to your door, which means one of two things. Um, it, well, actually, no, it means one thing, which is your chances are you're going to give up your position of power or you're going to flee the country. Even the ones that don't do that, when we have Maduro and when we have him from the ICC, we can pressure him for information in a way that we could not otherwise. We can get the details of the snakes in the government so we can weed them out before them transitioning power over to Guaido, who is currently the legitimate president according to their constitution. Um, then also as well, this is a big deal, but we're going to expel the ghost of Hugo Chavez. Listen, it's a real point, I promise you. So, <laughs> when it comes to your founders, they tend to be political stagnation. That's, you kind of get, you get really attached to the idea of how your nation started. And you know, being Irish and American in the room, I think we all kind of know what that looks like. That's why we still have a bipartisan system for the majority in the US, because that's what happened shortly after the nation was founded, and we feel bound to that tradition. We still talk about 1916 and remain politically center-right anti-Catholic church, because we have, a deep, we have a deep admiration and a deep identity associated with what founded our country. And Hugo Chavez being like the, essentially the political spiritual leader of um, Venezuela, there is, a, there is a sense there where they need to stick to the policies due to this strong identity they have formed in regards to their past. However, when you see Hugo Chavez's, um, not descendant, there's a political word I can't remember for. Um, well, and then the guy who's his heir, yes. So when you have Hugo Chavez's heir forcibly removed, and you can see that this is not the strongest policy, this is the policy that can be removed, this is the sort of political system that can be weeded out. What that means then is, I'll take you in 10 seconds. So what that means then <coughs> is that people no longer feel stagnant towards the policies which have driven them into this ground, and it opens up the new ground and new discourse for larger political parties to come in, they no longer feel pinned into the pigeonholes of their origin. Yes. I don't think this is true on the basis that um, there is, in fact, an alternative party currently headed by Guaido, which has all of the support of the people in the country at the moment. And we have failed to address our entire speech, um, my entire speech was about how this specific model will only reinforce narratives currently perpetuated in Venezuela, which will reinforce support for militia groups, which will remain after this model. Mark Porter, it's been 24 seconds. Um, so, <coughs> that actually is a very last point. Thankfully, I only have 30 seconds to go now because you gave us 30 seconds in a while. So, why better democracy is good? Well, number one, it's representative for the people in Italy. They can actually express what they want and get that back from the government. Number two, the material benefits of stability. You can't access other rights unless you feel stable. You cannot access your right to education if you're afraid to leave the house because of civil unrest. You cannot use your um, rights for freedom of speech when you have a dictator bringing down your neck. Stability and safety is facilitated, and with this, you can give Venezuela the rest of their rights. Um, then, sorry, moving on to Czech. 
essentially why I think it's a book properly described to children. That was Quiva Mimi starting off the bottom half of the debate, uh, providing some really great analysis and also showing us a little bit of that Irish wit, which is so fun, and we love that about BP debate. So now we are turning it over to LSUS competitor Dom Mercer to open up the closing side for opposition. In my opinion, personally, this is not a multilateral approach as they would have it have us believe. Simply for the fact that we see that the U.S. going in and intervening militarily, how it would unilaterally by itself with SEAL Team 6, does not involve Russia and does not involve China. And much of the question that I asked, uh, asked previously uh, in the point of information, this leads to massive international relations or massive international repercussions. Specifically, when we talk about SEAL Team 6 and how they would have to be delivered, they would have to be delivered through what's the, the United States SOAR units. Basically, it's stealth helicopters. But what we're not anticipating here is that Venezuela has Russian MiG attack fighters. So let's look specifically to an example in the past. When the special forces were used in this sense for the same sword units in Mogadishu in 1993, we saw that one rocket propelled grenade brought down the entire operation. And now we're going to put that same approach against attack fighters with lock-on capability. This is way proportionately not, uh, not feasible and leads to these international tensions that I specifically talked about, where we see Russia and China could find an American body trying to bring um, uh, Maguero out of power, which then pulls the United States completely out of the ring of becoming an actor and allows Russia to become the single and sole actor and become basically their pawn. So then this uh, brings me on specifically to the uh, leader of the opposition who comes in and quotes all of the risks. So we see specifically that the risks, yes, are there, but with their model they propose of pure diplomacy, we see specifically, Madam Speaker, that the diplomacy has been an option since Hugo Chavez. That's what we've been trying. And where has the results been? They just have not been there specifically. So while, yes, I believe that the approach of taking care of people without militarily intervening is a good thing, I specifically see we need to maybe adjust the plan to to better benefit the uh, better benefit everyone's international relationships and actually proceed through, and I'll take the first two questions up right now. Isn't the ICC already open <coughs> for Guaido? No, the ICC is not open an investigation. They have reports specifically on Guaido, but no actual investigation has been opened at this time, according to the Miami Herald a couple of days ago. Getting on even further than that, uh, then we go into the next uh, couple of speeches where Bobby then comes up and says the international um, relationships that I've already specifically said why that would work, and then second op comes in and. Uh, <coughs> basically says that uh, we're going to come in and oops, uh, yeah so it basically says that we're going to come in and all of this would be unlikely and that uh, we could expel the ghost of uh, Hugo Chavez and all that but all of this really doesn't meet the point today. The point today is we need to get Maduro out of power and specifically as our uh, people across the bench have said 90% of Venezuelans support Guaido. So Specifically, what we're all looking for here today, Madam Speaker, is the best way to get Guaido out of power and the least amount of people risking their lives. And that brings us sort of to our substantive uh, case today, where we take the model that the Prime Minister has offered, but instead of going to military <coughs> action or military intervening, how about we just ask, as I've already said in my point of information, that the uh, ICC open up an investigation through the uh, the seven, excuse me, yeah, the seven states, or, or say seven countries, according to Reuters on September 26, 2018, these six countries include Colombia, Argentina, Chile, Paraguay, Peru, Canada, France, and Germany. Each one of these have reported to the International Criminal Court, the ICC, that they would like to wear on their investigation. So if the ICC uh, allows this investigation to go through, then we actually see that now we have the multilateral support to go in and actually have it, uh, multilateral pressure, excuse me, to have this actually done. And what this pressure, once we have all of the groups, uh, obviously the question in a second, once we have all of these groups come together as a multilateral force and push uh, pressure onto Maduro, we will see that this will actually push him into hiding. And specifically, once he's pushed into hiding, Boyada or Guaido can come in specifically into power, and thus we have a quick power change right there with the least amount of lives. And even further, the ICC should indict all of the generals in his inner circle, so that way we don't see military 
action coming in specifically from this? And I'll take the first uh, question. Okay, despite the many successes we've seen from the ICC, there's been mm -hmm. consistent issues with bureaucracy and consistent issues with the time it takes them to do this. Yeah. What are we supposed to say to Venezuelans who are starving on the ground in the interim while we ask for a report? And I was actually just about to get to that. So we see that my, my, the Miami Herald reported a couple of days ago that despite all the obstacles you were bringing up, this is a direct quote, despite all the obstacles you were bringing up, or despite all these obstacles, these recent additions of France and Germany could speed up the ICC legal process, and like, the, and like all international organizations, the ICC is not immune to diplomatic, diplomatic pressure, and this is the first of its kind, which is the state referendum method, which has never been used in the ICC before. So all of this means that this is a new method the ICC has never been through, that's going to act a lot faster and will have a lot quicker results than any of the methods we produce here. Plus, we will see a lot less loss of lives because we are not risking international attention. Specifically, once the ICC is involved, Russia now becomes the malevolent actor if they go against it. China is a part of the ICC, so all international tensions have been diffused once the ICC comes out. And I'll take the last one question. Okay, so are we being led to believe that if we just politely ask the ICC with the help of these countries that they're just going to be like, here you go, investigation? No, not, not at all. Not just politely ask, but the, the ICC take into consideration the, uh, the, the documentation and everything that they have in order and not just go to U.S. first. So specifically what I'm saying here is that we not just ask them, but we take into consideration these countries that have already asked and we have it done. Um, getting one even further than that, even to produce substantial points of benefit here that I would like to bring up today. First, I've already told you that there will be no international repercussions, uh, international repercussions going on. But even further than that, we see specifically get to him, sorry. that once Mr. Herrera was hiding, he loses, uh, he loses his position of power, which immediately solves all of the issues at hand today, again, without a single bullet being fired. All of them, we have a multinational force, as we've already been calling, come in and look for them. But that's not the issue today. The aid, he crossed the aid points get open once he goes into hiding. The, once the generals are taken out, the military is no longer an issue. And even further than that, we see that the precedence of other dictators has been established. But even further than that, this is due process here. This isn't America saying that we go in first and we do what we want. No, we say we take everyone's uh, point into consideration and we allow due process to do its thing. And then we go in and we actually are, they go, or everyone goes in, excuse me. And then that's how justice is served, not just America. So getting on even further than that, it's a, it legitimizes the effort and not just America going in and having a lot of these issues that we're talking about. But even further than that, we see that um, we have to stop, as JFK basically said, we have to stop thinking about what we can get from Venezuela and start thinking about what we can actually do to help the 90% of Venezuelan people who are out there in our support. And with that, I feel good. That was Dom Mercer from LSUS Debate. And the final two speeches tonight are referred to as the whip speeches. And they have a very important job where they have to summarize everything that has been talked about and also just provide a few more really solid points to take everything home for their side. So we're going to turn it over to the government whip, who is Robert Diamond, who is a student here at UCC Cork. Nicolas Maduro is an illegitimate dictator. His re-election earlier this year was a fraud, it was a farce, and that's why he states around the world, particularly in the region we are talking about, instead support Juan Guado, who is proclaiming himself to be the interim president. That is the background that we are dealing with today, ladies and gentlemen, and that is why I'm going to show you in that context why uh, myself and Quiva were the only team uh, to really focus um, on, on the reality and the ground of the development of the people. There are three issues in this debate, and I'm going to discuss them. Um, first um, was uh, the ways in which we can go about helping uh, the reality and the ground of the development of the people and the alternatives to military action. Secondly, is what a post Maduro Venezuela looks like and any possible power vacuums. And thirdly, why the US isn't the nefarious actor that the opposition would lead you to believe they are. First, I'm going to talk about the international element uh, of the situation, which uh, was brought up on both uh, sides of the opposition bench, um, which is, you know, what, what will Russia do? They have uh, said multiple times that they support Maduro and his government. Look, what are they going to do? I mean, they're not going to put troops on the ground. We know this. It would be ridiculous for them to do that. And, but instead they say, okay, they're going to fund militia groups that support Maduro. The issue is that these militia groups do not exist. The national identity 
in which uh, Maduro took off in the kind of uh, romantic ideal of Hugo Chavez is dead against the Germans. So this idea that they're going to fund groups that, are, that support Maduro despite the fact that they spent the last few years starving is insane. The types of people that the Russians uh, are, are, are going to fund don't exist. Okay? So, what are the alternatives? First is sanctions. It's the first way we can punish the Maduro government. Would sanctions hurt the Maduro government? They would. After they've ravaged the entire nation, after literally every Venezuelan other than Maduro and his co supporters have died, right? So there's no thank you, Mark. Maduro has shown on countless occasions that he's willing to put himself and his very close comrades uh, far beyond Venezuelan people. Sanctions won't work. So this, you know, the US's recent uh, oil sanctions will only, uh, if, in other words, if Maduro is going to cut back anywhere, he's going to cut back on food supplies a hell of a lot sooner than he's going to cut back on the military or, you know, sustaining the government in this kind of form. Second is A. As Guido has pointed out, all attempts to uh, introduce A uh, into Venezuela have been stopped at the border. So we think, and given that, you know, Maduro has the support of the military, unless you move the, mili remove the military, you can't introduce why, why no? Why do we have to go through the military? Because the military is Maduro's last bastion of hope, right? It's the one thing that he can really cling to. So, in other words, if we are going to, in the future, introduce, uh, you know, aid into the country like it tries to be introduced uh, through the Venezuelan-Colombian border, you have to first uh, get through. Um, the military, and uh, you cannot circumvent the military in the way that the opposition are talking about. And this, specific this stability is, uh, we have told you why this stability is of the utmost importance to the Venezuelan people. Because people can't access education, people can't engage economically at the point at which, uh, you know, inflation is right to the extent that they, they don't know where their next meal is coming from. Stability of the, uh, is of the utmost importance and we were the only team that brought you that. Uh, I'm going to get one more point and then I'll go back to Mark. Um, what does the post Maduro Venezuela look like? Firstly, there is political opposition. So all the talk of terror vacuum is totally irrelevant. On one hand, they can't go both ways, pal. On one hand, they say that Juan Guado is a viable alternative for a back half table crop. But on the other hand, they talk of a power vacuum. It cannot be both. The reality is, of course, that there is a legitimate political alternative in the form of Juan Guado. So the idea that Iraq is going to repeat itself is nonsensical. Uh, no thank you. Secondly is, um, please talk to you about breaking the cult of personality. And the reality on the ground in Venezuela is that the, put this, the ghost of Hugo Chavez lives on. And we think that the point at which you cut off uh, the last uh, inkling of the romantic idea of Hugo Chavez um, is the point at which Venezuela's democracy can move on. Mark, I'll take you. Yeah, so I'd be correct if you identified there the military is the key in all of this, right? Um, we told you how specifically this model drives military support towards Maduro. In my speech, I told you that the only way to achieve peace is to drive support towards exactly, Maduro. Exactly, Mark. Drive I, them. No. So how do no, you figure it out? Mark, as I, as I, I, I take your point, but this is exactly what I've already replied to you in your speech. It doesn't drive support, it doesn't drive uh, support to Maduro by virtue of the fact that there isn't a uh, singular unifying national identity that the entire op case is based on. The, the, the military support Maduro because Maduro oh, enriches there. the military. And Maduro, um, uh, Maduro's main priority is the military. That's where the military supports them. The point at which you can uh, you know, circumvent the military is, 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 is when you can make strides in Venezuela. On that point, sir. Um, no, thank you. Now, finally, is the issue of uh, whether or not um, uh, whether or not the US is a legitimate actor, uh, whether or not it, it, it has ulterior motives. Um, firstly, is there are now uh, checks and balances that don't exist. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll take back half of the point. Go on. Just, okay. yeah. So specifically you say that you want to help the people, but you talk about adding more sanctions and, uh, and specifically going after with military results, but how would you respond if both of these directly affect the people you are trying to protect? Okay, well, I mean, the first thing, firstly, is a comparison. I mean, they're already starving in Venezuela. There's not a huge amount to lose. Secondly, um, is, I mean, the idea that, 
the, uh, the model that the proposition brought up is going to be huge amounts of bloodshed. It's just nonsensical. It's not the debate we're having today. Um, but in terms of why uh, the US isn't this kind of uh, terrifying actor that's all here in London, um, it's threefold. Firstly, because we live in a far more global world than we used to. There are far more checks and balances. People are aware of the US's past military intervention, and by virtue of that, uh, they, they, won't be, they won't allow the US uh, to, to get up to the same antics uh, as they have uh, in, in other interventions. Uh, second is because the US doesn't have a monopoly um, on military power um, like they did during past interventions. And thirdly, because of the rise of social media, it's far easier for Venezuelans on the ground um, uh, to, to show the outer world um, the effect that the intervention is having on them. For those reasons, ladies and gentlemen, I urge you to propose the motion. Thank you. Was Robert Dynan representing UCC Court, finishing up the side government bench. Now we'll turn it over to LSUS's competitor, Mary Catherine Purcell, to finish the debate for side opposition. Stay tuned after the debate for a little discussion between me and Jack Rogers about how the debate went, and then we'll head over to adjudication. Thank you from the LSUS debate team, and also say hello to everyone back at home, including Huge thank you to everyone here in Fort Garland. We've had a blast, and we loved it. Okay, so first thing I'm going to do for you, Madam Speaker, is I'm going to get into some reputation from the government whip, and then I'm going to get into three impactful questions about why you should feel comfortable voting for the opposition in today's round. So, first and foremost, remember my point talked about people cannot currently access education and they cannot access food. Therefore, he goes on to explain that you should vote for the government because they've solved this issue. However, whatever the government plan fails, this is going to make the current issue even worse. At the point whenever the Russian name, as my opponent has actually mentioned in his speech and as the leader of the second opposition, he mentioned that the SEAL team plan that they have provided won't even make it to the ground because the Russian name can locate, identify, and destroy them. And at the point that any American body is found on this oil and soil is going to increase the tensions and make every situation that there is in the status quo even worse. So now let's get into um, a couple things that everyone here agrees with. We all agree that there has been a massive amount of suffering by the people of Venezuela at the hands of Maduro. Who is the major problem here? Maduro. He needs to go. Change is clearly overdue. Diplomacy has not um, been effective as the, uh, the top half wants to suggest. They should just take care of it themselves. So as every party provides you a plan, Madam Speaker, you need to consider the risk calculus. So let's get into those three substantive questions for you. The first of which is going to be, where is our credibility? At the point that this house represents the United States, the government is advocating that the United States act alone. The first step to their action is unilateral action. They say, yeah, the United States should take the first step, and everyone else come together and say it was a great idea, which sounds hopeful, but it's not multinational. Moving on to the first opposition, they ultimately state that the United States has no moral obligation to help. Again, where is the credibility for the United States to the point where whenever people are starving and dying, we have no moral obligation to help them? The second question is going to be, who promotes and builds up international cooperation? So the government ultimately says, sure, we hope for international cooperation, but we're going to go in and guns the blaze and then see what happens first. No thank you, ma'am, not this time. We're going to go in and guns the blaze and then everyone's just going to agree that that was a great idea and we're going to figure things out together now. But again, that is not multinational cooperation. The first opposition states that they want to let Venezuela basically figure it out and that no other country has any say. If that were the case, if Venezuela could just figure it out on their own, they would have done that already. Yes, I'll take my first with two questions. Okay, so you just stated that if Venezuela was able to do it themselves, they would have done it already. That's exactly what I stated in my speech, correct? When I stated that, that's why the ICC exists for countries who don't have the power to punish war criminals on their own. That's why we're bringing it in. Correct, and so the first opposition actually stated that they wanted diplomacy within Venezuela to basically just handle it without the United States getting involved. So let's get into the next point. Um, so uh, the second opposition, ultimately, not only is our first step a multinational step, but the entire process is. At the point where countries around the globe, and we've heard multiple times the bottom half of today's debate, that the world today is an increased globalized age. At that point, we must respect the globalization, and we must come together with the international criminal court. Moving on to the third question of the major three. Who has best impact on life? 
The government ultimately says that there is going to be, I'm sorry, there is going to be no solvency whenever their plan fails. At the point that the Russians have sold these MiGs, <coughs> which are, again, are like fighter jets they need to whenever they've sold them to the Venezuelan people, that means that no SEAL team can just ride in on their helicopters. They will be located and destroyed. That will, just, will provide American bodies on Venezuelan soil, which we've all heard is going to be a huge disaster and mistake and lead to increased tensions. Um, no, thank you, sir. Moving into the first opposition's answer, they basically just want a worse version of the status quo. Ultimately, Venezuelan people, they need to figure it out. Venezuelan people, they're the matter, but they can do it themselves. Again, the status quo is that situation where they're trying to help themselves. Some people are for it, some people are against it. Things are not good. Things are consistently getting worse. However, whenever you look to, no thank you, ma'am, the second opposition, it immediately improves the quality of life. At the point where we have heard multiple times in the second half of the debate from the government that we live in an increased, globalized world, and that the United States cannot just get away with doing something on their own, you have to take this multinational approach. No thank you, ma'am. So in this multinational approach, no thank you. Ultimately, what we see is multiple countries, right, global community, will not condemn this, rather they will be for this. And then what happens, as my opponent has stated, is that Maduro will go into hiding. At the point where the International Criminal Court says, we are coming for you to an investigation of war, of, uh, war crimes, ultimately. No, thank you, ma'am. Whenever we come to you to investigate for war crimes, Maduro is going to go into hiding or he's going to flee. At that point, Guaido, who we've already heard, I believe from the opening prime minister, that 90% of the Venezuelan people actually stand behind Guaido, that is going to be a huge benefit. Also, whenever, no, thank you, ma'am. Um, at the point whenever we understand, uh, not only does that mean people back Guaido, but also he's agreed to, within six months, right, have free election. So what happens next? The aid is allowed in. The military becomes indicted, as my opponent, I'm sorry, as my partner stated. No, thank you, ma'am. And so what we see here, from these three questions, where is the credibility of this house, the United States? Who promotes and builds up international cooperation? No, thank you, ma'am. Again, and lastly, the third, who has the best impact on life? At the end of the day, it is going to be the plan provided to you by the closing opposition. And that is going to be let the International Criminal Court start their investigation. As we see, they need to approach this from a multinational point. And with my last few seconds, I would like to again thank everyone back home, thank all of our supporters, thank you to my amazing coaches, Court Ireland, you are beautiful, and it's going to be really hard to see here. Oh, gosh. Um, and I thank you for the rest of my time. Thank you. And that was Mary Catherine Purcell representing LSUS debate, finishing up the debate for side opposition. So now what happens is the chief adjudicator, who is Molly Cavanaugh from UCC Cork, is calling the adjudicators to leave the room and uh, engage in some discussion to figure out who they feel came out on top and who won the debate. So during that time, while they're the, they are discussing, Dr. Jack Rogers and I will also be, be providing some commentary, chatting about what we think about the debate until they come back and uh, give us their call, which is the final decision on who won. So we'll give them just a moment to step out, and then we'll start in. Oh. So what happens now, like I said, is the adjudicators, who are essentially the judges, are going to depart from the chambers and decide who they think won the debate. We've got four adjudicators on the panel tonight. Uh, it is being chiefed by Molly Cavanaugh, one of the students here at UCC Cork, and she is accompanied by Lori Shelley, another student here from UCC Cork. And then we have Trey Gibson, who is the coach from LSUS, who is with us on this year's Montgomery Cup. And then also Alex Amos, who is a graduate assistant coach for the University of Central Missouri. So the four of them are going to do dis some discussion, weigh the pros and cons of the debate, and they will come back and give their call. But in the meantime, we're going to chat about what we think about tonight's debate. 
So there was a lot of really exciting things going on, um, all focusing on whether or not the United States should militarily intervene in Venezuela. And the way that British parliamentary debate works, as you saw or heard, is there are actually eight debaters in the room, and they are broken into four teams of two. And so it does actually represent parliament. So the first team who started their speeches was the opening government, and the first speaker is actually referred to as the prime minister. And Matthew Briggs from the University of Central Missouri was this tonight's prime minister. Jack, what do you think about Matthew's case? How do you think he did in setting up tonight's debate? Well, I, I think Matthew uh, sets up a good case. Um, it, it's difficult uh, in, in uh, a multinational or an international um, debate to really um, go all in on the United States. I mean, it, it's difficult. The reputation of the U.S. Uh, across the globe is mixed. Um, and so I think he, he does a good job of uh, sticking with the heart of the, res uh, the resolution, which is whether or not the United States should militarily intervene without, you know, calling for a full-scale invasion or, um, you know, something in that manner. Um, I, I think, you know, his idea about sending in uh, a SEAL team to effectively snatch uh, Maduro and bring him to the international court is, is one way to intervene militarily with the smallest footprint, military footprint, without boots on the ground. Um, I think that... Um, the opposition points out some some interesting things about how Russia would mm -hmm. react to that, how China might react to that, how other, uh, given the United States uh, record in multinational unilateral actions, um, you know, there there there's some good questions there, and I mm -hmm. think it was a good debate on both sides uh, about those questions about the uh, impact that might arise out of those actions. And that seemed to be one of the big key factors of tonight's debate was if the United States sends in a SEAL team, is that actually a multinational approach or is that more of a unilateral approach? It seemed to be one of the, the, the complex discussions of tonight's debate. So, so what do you think about that? Well, you know, I, you know, I think the prime minister, I think Matthew, is basically trying to argue that the initial action would be uh, a unilateral action. The U.S. would simply, without permission, without the blessing of the world, go in and, and take Maduro and, you know, deliver him to the ICC. At that point, then any action that would follow up, um, putting the country back together, um, you know, um, bringing the Venezuelan people back to a democracy that they control, would be a multinational effort. Mm -hmm. Now, I think the opposition does a good job of, of pointing out that, you know, just because we, we do that doesn't mean that a lot of those players are going to just fall in line and cooperate. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, I, I, I think it's a, a good way of, of looking at things. Um, it's a very, very complex situation that's changing literally you know, as we <laughs> every debate day. every yeah. day, <laughs> and it's tough to to follow and to to keep all the players straight. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it it it's it's a mess mm -hmm. right now. It is. You yeah. mentioned some of these players and uh, in the debate, and then you also talked already about um, Russia and China. So we definitely have these other potential actors. Um, playing a part in this <laughs> very interesting story as well. So what did you think about um, this whole idea of looking at oil and how oil is going to play a part in this whole situation? Well, politically, I mean, Maduro is propped up by Russia. Um, they're one of his strongest supporters. And obviously, with uh, Venezuelan oil reserves, Russia stands to gain quite a bit. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, Venezuelan oil reserves. Obviously, Russia does not want the United States involved because, again, um, you know, that would go against their man. You know, mm -hmm. and right now their man 
is helping them to secure those oil reserves. They worry that we, uh, by supporting WADA, would end up with the oil reserves. Mm -hmm. China is a player. They're also looking at the same situation. Um, Russia and China are both attempting to project their power across the world. I mean, we're, we're currently, you know, struggling over um, rare earth minerals in Africa. You know, everywhere you go in the, in the world, um, you have those three major superpowers trying to control as best they can rare earth minerals, um, trying to control oil reserves. Obviously, when the U.S. went into the Middle East, um, that was one of the chief criticisms by China and by Russia was, hey, we're just there because we want the Iraqi oil. Um, so oil is important. You know, oil is one of those cards, one of those trading cards that both sides, all three sides are going to struggle over. And I think it's perfectly legitimate for um, the opposition to bring oil into it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I do think that's one of the major motivations for Russia. And I think you bring up a really good point about power and control. I mean, when we think about these big key players and these massive countries and their involvement, I mean, one of the points for um, the opposition saying we shouldn't get involved is why does the United States constantly feel like they need to step in and do the dirty work and take control? Perhaps maybe they should just step out of it and let other people you know, solve their own matters. So uh, it, it is always a, a really interesting uh, debate. It's always a really interesting idea that pops up is, you know, how does control and how does power really play into this? Do we have any authority to jump in and be a part or should we just step back and not become involved in this crisis? Well, you know, ever since, you know, Desert Storm, um, I mean, I think that's been one of the things that's been kicked back and forth um, by all major political parties, by um, presidential candidates. You know, um, should the United States be the policeman of the world? Should we be getting involved in these international um, hotspots? Um, you know, uh, it's no secret I spent 42 years in the military, in the in the reserves, in the National Guard, and some on active duty, and. You know, there, there comes a point where you don't necessarily want to get involved, but if we don't, then Russia and China will get involved and they have a free hand. And I'm sure that that is a discussion that they have in the Kremlin. I'm sure that's a discussion that the major um, political leaders in China have. You know, mm -hmm. if they don't get involved, um, you know, then that gives the United States a free reign. And sure. so it's a, it's a power struggle. Um, I think isolationism is, is probably something that um, that ship has sailed. I just don't think that the United States or any nation can afford to be isolationist in this, you know, multinational global economy, global environment. I just don't think that we can, can do that. No, that's a good point, and I think that's a great segue into discussing the bottom half of the debate. But before we jump into that, just to give everybody back home a little bit more overview of this format of debate, because it isn't quite um, as familiar, and it's not quite as popular, unfortunately, in our region. That's why we come over here to do it. <laughs> um, so, like I said a little bit earlier, there are four teams of two. So you'll hear us referring to the top half of the debate and the bottom half of the debate. And the top half of the debate is comprised of the prime minister and the deputy prime minister. So you have one team representing the side government and then the leader of the opposition and the deputy, um, which is one team representing the opposition. And so that top half of the debate is really those four individuals going back and forth, um, rebuilding their case, rebutting what the previous debater said before them. And I think we saw tonight, this was a really, really strong top half of the debate, which was great. It leads to a fantastic bottom half. So just a quick little recap of who filled those positions tonight. Matthew Briggs from the University of Central Missouri was our prime minister. Bobby Gums from the University of Central Missouri was the deputy prime minister. So they were um, the opening government team. 
And then on opening opposition, the leader of the opposition was Marco Gorman, a student here at UCC Cork, and he was followed up by his deputy, Kasia Martushka, and they, again, opened up a pretty solid case for the for side opposition. So that brings us down to the bottom half of the debate. So on the bottom half, because this represents parliament, what this really looks like is the second government team um, represents the team in parliament who, uh, or the party in parliament, who didn't necessarily have enough b votes to become the uh, primary party in charge, but they definitely are um, in alignment with the government bench. Do you want to add to that? Yeah, it, you know, their, their British parliamentary debate is set up much like parliament. They have coalition governments, and so whoever can garner the most seats in parliament, that becomes the government party. Uh, and they have the responsibility and also, I guess you, you might say the fringe benefit of, of having the prime minister. There are other parties within parliament that align themselves with the prime minister's party. And then there are those parties that oppose the prime minister's party. So it would be kind of like our Congress, instead of having just the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, you would also have, for an example, maybe a labor party or maybe a, a progressive party, a green party. Uh, so there's several little factions that then align themselves together to garner enough votes to then pass legislation. So the bottom half, as you say, represents those parties that aren't necessarily in power, but they support the parties that are in power. So second government supports the prime minister's government party. The second opposition then would support the leader of the opposition's party. And they might have different reasons for wanting the resolution to go through, but they support the resolution. But, you know, it, it's in the United States, you know, we have two teams and it's either affirmative or negative. In the UK, as you've, you know, brought up, there are four teams. And so it's, it's kind of like, yeah, we're on the same side, we're government, but we're in competition with you because uh, there are four teams and what the adjudicators do is they rank the teams one, two, three, four. So what you're hoping is that your team gets the one, mm -hmm. right? So you support the prime minister, but you don't want them to have the one. You, <laughs> you, you just assume they get the two, the three, the four. Right. You want the one. So it, it's interesting to see the delicate interplay between the different teams where they feel like they have to support their side, mm -hmm. but they also want to emerge on top. Right. So right. it's like, yeah, 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 we agree, but, mm -hmm. you know, so... Um, I, th I think this is a good debate where you saw the bottom half of the debate where those teams continue to argue both for and against the resolution, but they did it in their own way and in mm -hmm. a unique way that would set them apart mm -hmm. and make them distinct so that they would stick out and justify, you know, a one or a two down on the bottom half of the debate. Right. That's why we keep this guy around. That was an excellent discussion. That was an excellent explanation of the BP format. So uh, thank you for that. <laughs> well, it's, you know, the people at home, um, you know, it, it's, it's not something that they're necessarily familiar with. Right. And so, you know, a lot of times people will talk to me about the debates and they don't, it's hard for them to follow mm -hmm. why people are doing what they're doing because we're used to a two-party system. Mm -hmm. And over here, it's, it's a multi-party system. It's coalition government. And so the way that we approach debate is just a little bit different. Right, right. right. Yep, absolutely. So let's chat a little bit then about the closing um, or the bottom half of the debate. And so we opened up the bottom half of the debate with the closing government speech given by Cuiva. 
And like you said, she has a very unique role to fill in that position where she does need to stand in affirmation of the resolution and parts of the case that the prime minister put forward, but she needs to present it in a new and different way or perhaps provide a little bit um, of a different analysis, bring some new points to the table. How do you think she did? I thought she did really well. Um, I, you know, she talked about sanctions and she talked about Maduro's partners and weeding those partners out. It's not enough to just go after Maduro and bring Maduro to justice, but if you yank him out of the equation, what happens if one of his deputies steps up? What if one of his generals has a military coup and seizes power over the, uh, the government? And so what they're arguing or what she argued was we need some sort of balanced approach not just madura as the top half argued but also his lieutenants his generals his military taking out the infrastructure mm -hmm. so that they didn't just step into the power vacuum and we've got more of the same i thought she did a really fine job right. of supporting the top half but then this is why we're distinct mm -hmm. this is why we're different this is why we have a better solution right, right. and yeah. we we refer to that as role fulfillment here in right. this style of debate and that's definitely something that comes up in adjudication did everybody fulfill their role did they do it well so I think you're right. I think Quiva did a fantastic job there. And then we turned it over to Dom on side opposition from Louisiana State University Shreveport. And um, I think one of the really interesting points that he brought up is that whole concept of the ICC investigation. So how does that really play a part? Is that actually a viable option? Should we just investigate rather than <laughs> you know, just assume like, oh, here he is <laughs> and hand him over. So looking at the ICC's partnership and all of this and, and how that would come to fruition. Yeah, I think that was really smart, you know, on, on uh, Dom's part is, you know, if the, um, if the government is going to say, let's basically kidnap Madura and take him to the ICC and turn him over, uh, what Dom was arguing is, well, maybe we ought to let the ICC conduct the investigation first and mm -hmm. charge him as a war criminal. What that does is it gives whomever goes in to get him, it gives him power and legitimacy. Mm -hmm. It's not just, hey, you're accused, so we're going to kidnap you. It's, hey, you've been accused and investigated and convicted in abstentia. Now you're a war criminal. Now there's a warrant for your arrest. Now mm -hmm. we're going to come get you. So whether it's the, you know, even if it's the United States that does it, um, you know, no one can say that we're, you know, jumping the gun, that we're not going in without justification. Um, and if the ICC, and I think he made a really good point that if the ICC does convict Maduro, then it puts Russia in a very interesting position because their boy that they've been <laughs> supporting is suddenly convicted. So maybe mm -hmm. Russia gets a little quieter and says, well, maybe we need to help mm -hmm. bring him to justice. See, we, we, we never meant for him to go rogue on us. <laughs> um, so in order to save face, there might be a better propensity for a multinational kind of thing because now we have the justification to actually go and get him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you bring up a good point there. And so then well, the f he did. Oh, well, well that is true. Yeah, <laughs> Dom did. That was yeah, definitely Dom, Dom did a good job. <laughs> and then that brings us to the last two speeches of the debate. And like I said, as we were uh, kind of voiceovering during the debate, those last two speeches are called the whip speeches. So you have the government whip and you have the opposition whip. And the whip speech is a very important speech. They've got a lot to do in their seven minutes. So they basically have to do some rebuttal. But then they really have to leave the lasting stamp as to why their bench and their team deserves the one, like Jack talked about. So not only are they trying to basically summarize the debate and rebut the debater before them and the points that were made in that speech before them, they're trying to leave that lasting impression with the, adjudicator, the adjudicators to say, hey, this is why we win. This is why we remain on top. 
And I think we had some really good whip speeches today. Uh, side government speech was given by Robert Deneen, from a student here at UCC Cork, and he boiled it down to three key points. So how otherwise could we help? You know, looking at some of the alternatives, perhaps military intervention isn't the most proper way to get involved. He talked about that world post Maduro. What does it look like? And then he also, you know, examined the the concept that maybe the U.S. isn't this huge enemy <laughs> that is uh, being portrayed. Like maybe they are actually the most um, the, the key player here that needs to get involved. So what do you think about his case? What do you think about those lasting points? Well, I think they're smart. You know, um, most of the opposition bench, they're, uh, and bench is just a fancy word for side. Right, right. right. The opposition yeah. bench, uh, because in parliament they all sit on the same bench, mm -hmm. you know. Um, most of the opposition bench arguments centered around the idea of the U.S. and our horrible reputation for intervening mm -hmm. in Iraq and when have we ever been successful and people are just going to hate us and it's going to destroy our, any soft power. Um, and I think he got up and he said, look, you know, we're not as bad as people portray us. And, you know, the Soviet Union is always rattling its saber. China is always rattling their saber. We always rattle our saber. Um, but when in history, in recent history, has it actually come to blows? Mm -hmm. And so basically what it was saying is, yeah, you can say that Russia is going to threaten this and China is going to threaten that. The question is, are they going to actually do anything? And mm -hmm. if they're not actually going to do anything, then what's the risk? Why not try uh, some sort of intervention? So I think it was smart for him yeah. to attempt to take out that, that threat because I think that's the biggest chip that the opposition bench has mm -hmm. is the threat of Russia or China escalating the uh, situation into a shooting war. Sure, yeah. Yeah. And then side opposition was closed out by Mar Mary Catherine Purcell from Louisiana State University, Shreveport. And she also posed three sort of lasting key points mm -hmm. for us to think about or for the adjudicators to think about. And those were, where is the United States accountability? So again, really looking at, is it our job to get involved in yet another international conflict? Um, she also talked about who builds that international um, cooperation and then the impact on life. Oh, looks like they, uh, the adjudicators are back, so let's tune to them to find out the final call, and then we'll wrap up after that. So the adjudicators are filing back in, and the debaters are taking their seat in the chamber. The announcement will come from the chief adjudicator. Very good discussion. Um, we came to a unanimous call. Um, I think the way we're going to do it is that we're just going to announce the call, and if you want like feedback, come to us. That would just, uh, just be easiest, and also if it's quite late, I know people might want to get home quickly with the rain and stuff. But anyway, so the way we did it was we did first to CG, second to OG, third to CO, and then fourth to um, OO. So congratulations, everyone did really well. Thank you. <laughs> if you want to have a chat with any of us about the call or like why we decided the way that we did, just come to any of us because um, yeah. everyone was quite good. Um, we're more than happy to talk to everybody. But anyways, thank you for what was a really good debate. Thank you guys for being here. Um, <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you.
All right, so we're about to um, reiterate that call in just a moment. We just want to get a little bit more confirmation there. Some clarification yeah. on the, yeah. The, the chamber that we're in is absolutely phenomenal. You can see it in the frame there. Um, rough acoustics, a little echoey, so we can't quite hear super well over on this side. Matthew was two. Okay, so it looks to be that it was a side government bench, which means that the adjudicators felt that side gov um, was unanimous in, in winning tonight's debate. They gave the one to closing government, and they gave the two to opening government. So UCC Cork got the one, UCM got the two in opening government, Closing Opposition, LSUS, got the three in tonight's debate, and Opening Opposition got the four, and that was another team from UCC Cork. I'm sure that adjudication was extremely difficult because tonight's debate really was fantastic. Um, and, and this is just a great... Um, and we're so excited to be able to provide this commentary and do this for you. Not only does it give our digital media production students some amazing hands-on experience in live and remote studio production, but I think this is a great way to connect our audience in a little bit more and show them how impactful this experience is on all of our students. Um, they're making connections with students over in a different country. They're getting to talk about real world issues that have huge implications with individuals who have a very different uh, perspective and understanding of the world and upbringing and background. And this just does so much to open their eyes and broaden their perspective. And that's just the debates alone. And now we're not even talking about the history that we take in, the tourism that we take in. Uh, this really, truly is a remarkable experience for everybody involved. And we are so thankful for all of you who are tuning in, who are supporting LSUS debate, UCM debate, digital media productions, because this really is a huge operation, but it is absolutely worth it for our students. It, it's a mind-blowing trip. It changes their world. And uh, we, that's why we do it. That's why we do it every year. Jack, do you have anything else you want to say before we wrap up tonight? Yeah, um, the way that the um, BP scoring system works is with the University of Cork taking the one and the four and the UCM LSUS taking the two and the three. What that basically comes out to is a tie. It's a tie between yeah. the, uh, the, the universities, the U.S. and the um, Irish universities, which as close as that debate was, makes a tremendous amount mm -hmm. of sense. Um, I w yeah, I, 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 you know, I started this 23 years ago with four students and myself, and now we're bringing, you know, a broadcast team along. We have partnering universities, um, you know, to, to watch the digital media people, you know, drag, you know, tons oh of equipment goodness. through, through the, the rain, through the monsoon <laughs> that's, that's taking place outside and set it up and, um, trying to fight the firewall, trying to fight a different electronic system, and still being able to tape delay uh, and provide commentary. Um, you know, it's, it's why we bring students over here, right? They will learn more outside of the classroom, mm -hmm. actually doing it out in the field and trying to overcome technical difficulties. Um, I, I know that the debaters were concerned about the Irish accents and you know could they understand them I mean it, it just that's the way that you learn how to mm -hmm. function outside of your own little bubble mm -hmm. and that's all about what a university education is right we're promoting that worldly perspective that global perspective right yeah okay so I guess we're wrapping up here from Cork uh, we're being shown a, a cartoon. Oh, yes. yes yeah, it's right. all about opportunity and action yeah. for our, our students here. You know, yeah. they're learning skills on the fly. They're debating in a different country. I mean, it's all opportunity and action. It really is. It's fantastic. It's learning to a greater degree. It's everything. It's so great for our students. We will be tuning in again live from Dublin. Thursday evening. Um, well, Evening for us, afternoon yeah. for afternoon, you. Yeah, <laughs> afternoon for y'all, uh, but it'll be Thursday evening, and um, we'll have more information coming out on the web and on Facebook mm -hmm. and through our regular university channels to let people tune in to the debate in Dublin, which 
that resolution will be uh, this House, as a Democratic Party, would choose Bernie Sanders as their presidential candidate. So it's going to be very interesting oh, listening yeah. to the Irish debate Bernie Sanders. <laughs> um, so you'll definitely want to tune in for oh, that you're one. You're going to want to hear that <laughs> one. That's that's probably going to be quite entertaining. It will. It will. So oh. we'll sign off now from Cork and from the University College Cork. This is Dr. Jack Rogers and Dr. Nikki Freeman. And we say good evening, or I guess good afternoon. Good afternoon. And we'll see you in a couple of days.